Welcome everyone to the uh, Bluetooth for High Precision Indoor Positioning webinar. This webinar is brought to you by Ublox and my name is Agnes Derderian. I will be your moderator uh, during this webinar. Uh, so without further ado, um, uh, some housekeeping information. Uh, so this webinar will be sent to you automatically uh, after the, um, uh, the webinar is over. Uh, the presentation will be available as a PDF on demand. Uh, and you're free to ask any question uh, during the session, uh, but we will take them at the end as we have the, we have a Q&A session. And you can see how to place question here on this tab called questions. Uh, the agenda for this webinar is first we'll go through a technology background. So Pele will introduce later, we'll show you how. Uh, and then when Tias will uh, take over the deep dive into Bluetooth direction finding, uh, as well as indoor positioning demonstrations, you will see what uh, we've achieved so far. Uh, and Pele will take over back the application and use cases. And at the end, as I mentioned, there will be a Q&A session. Uh, and throughout uh, the, the presentation, we'll have a few polls uh, where we will uh, ask you uh, some questions to get your view on this topic. Uh, first, I would like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Pele Svensson. Uh, Pele has um, uh, area of expertise within the short-range wireless connectivity as well as industrial automation and communication. Uh, Pele has experience as um, a product marketing manager for uh, Industry 4.0 and healthcare. Uh, and he has also 15 years of experience within industrial automation from Alpha Laval, uh, ABB and Aylen Bradley. Uh, Pele also has uh, uh, 20 years experience in wireless uh, for industrial and medical uh, with Ericsson, Bluetooth Stick, Connected Blue and uh, Connect Blue and Ublox. Our second speaker is uh, Matthias Malin. Uh, Matthias has expertise of uh, areas uh, areas of expertise within uh, short range wireless um, technologies as well as Bluetooth and Wi-Fi based system design. Um, Matthias has experience within hardware design and signal processing of wireless system. Uh, Matthias also has 20 years of experience in development of uh, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi products uh, with uh, less wire and, and the U-blocks, uh, and also within uh, Bluetooth C. So without further ado now, I will hand over the world to Pele and we'll dive into the technology background. Okay, thank you, Agnes. Uh, it's nice to see so many attendees. Uh, uh, should be interesting to have your comments and questions. Uh, let's start with a technology background as an introduction to the specific Bluetooth 5.1 features. Let's uh, have a look at some of the short range technologies that are and can be used for indoor positioning. Uh, some of them are we are evaluating and working with uh, here in Ublox. Uh, the, let's start with the one, uh, one of the Wi-Fi based methods that has been around for a while called the finger, Wi-Fi fingerprinting. In this application and this use case, a Wi-Fi enabled device will scan and look for access points that are close by, uh, observe the MAC addresses of these access points together with the signal strength, which is of course an indication of how far away they are. Uh, and collect that information, send it in a collected uh, packet uh, fingerprint to a server database. Uh, that database includes a large number of observations uh, combining uh, the fingerprint and related positions. So the location uh, service uh, will then provide back as a result to the client device an approximate location uh, of the device. This database is normally sourced by smartphones that uses its built-in GPS and sensor in combination with Wi-Fi fingerprints to populate the database. Next slide. This is another Wi-Fi based method introduced a few years ago in the IEEE 802.11mc specification. Uh, we call it uh, time of flight. There are other uh, terminologies used as well. 
in this scenario, in this use case, uh, the access point and the client are both active by uh, time stamping messages that are flying uh, between access point and the client. So they time it when it's leaving and they time it when it, it's arriving and vice versa. Uh, and in order, uh, all, all of this is done in order to calculate an approximate distance between the two based on, on that uh, radio traffic is, is using the, the speed of light over the air. Uh, in a configuration with multiple access points in such a system, it's possible to provide an approximate location, given that the, access, the location of the access points are known. Uh, with this method, we can achieve an accuracy of one to two meters. A uh, newer Wi-Fi chipset often has the support built in that is required for lower level timing of these messages uh, uh, to support the time of flight feature. Next slide. This is the Bluetooth method based on, on signal strength. Uh, has been around uh, for quite some time and used in very many applications uh, for beaconing, uh, uh, etc. It's supported by any Bluetooth low energy implementation. It does not require Bluetooth 5.1. In this use case, Bluetooth beacon messages the client uh, in the picture, the black dot, are, are uh, received uh, by anchor nodes, the antenna symbol in the picture here. And the anchor node then estimates the distance from a tag based on the received signal string. Um, in the method, the anchor node only knows the distance to the tag and has no information about from what angle the, the client device or the tag in this picture is, is sending the signal. In the picture to the right, you see a combination of three anchor nodes and one tag. And of course, if you know the distance to the tag from the anchor to the tag in three uh, from three different anchors, it's possible to collect call, calculate an approximate location in the room. Again, given that the anchor nodes position are known. With this method, you can get the accuracy of a few meters. This is now Bluetooth 5.1, next picture. Bluetooth 5.1 uh, introduces a, a feature, main feature called direction finding. Uh, two different methods are being uh, defined in the specification, angle of arrival, AOA, and angle of departure, AOD. With the Bluetooth direction finding feature, it's possible to detect not only the, the distance to a, to a tag or a client, but also the angle from where that signal is, is received. So in the picture here, you still have the, the blue dot, which is the tag and the uh, antenna image is the anchor node. In the picture below, you can see an example here where the, an anchor node calculates the angle of arrival of the signal from the tag. So now it can provide a better accuracy of where that tag is located. The combination of distance and angle is provide, used to provide a location of the tag. As we will see in the deep dive later in this webinar, this has the potential to provide very good accuracy in indoor location solutions. Next slide. And here is an example of, of multiple anchor nodes and a client, the tag, the black dot that is sending this specific uh, direction finding signal. Uh, with multiple anchor nodes, each detecting the angle to the tag, the client device here in the middle, uh, and some mathematics, triangulation, it is possible to achieve an accuracy of one meter. Actually, we'll see later on in the presentation that we have been able to achieve even better than one meter accuracy. Next slide. Here is a configuration of a typical indoor positioning system using angle of arrival. What we see here is one tag, two anchors, uh, anchor nodes with an antenna array of four antennas each. Uh, they're using this angle uh, antenna array to detect the signal from where the tag is transmitting the angle of arrival, so to say. And with multiple an 
anchor as at known location, the angle from where the tag is transmitting, all that data is then sent to a positioning engine, which calculates the position of the tag. In this configuration, the position engine uh, knows the, the tag location and is able to track it. In the next slide, we are doing basically the opposite, the anchor node. In this angle of arrival, angle of departure configuration, the anchor node with multiple antennas in an array transmits the direction finding signal to the tracker node you see here on the bottom picture. Knowing the location of the different anchors, the tracker is able to calculate its own position or transfer the received information, anchor information, to a central positioning engine. This is a typical configuration used in a navigation use case. And the last picture in my session here is a table that provides a summary of our experience with different short range methods for indoor positioning. I'm not uh, intended to go into detail here. It's an overview that we have included for your, for your reference. And please observe that the obtained accuracy depends very much on the deployment uh, meaning the number of anchor points and the location of the anchor points. So now back to Agnes. Thank you very much, Pele. And actually now it's time for a poll. Uh, so as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, there are a few things we would like to get your uh, point of view on. Uh, and uh, one of the first thing uh, we would like to ask you uh, is uh, which uh, connectivity technologies are you planning to implement or are already implementing for your indoor positioning application. And you can, you can select um, uh, many or uh, that many that applies. Are you using Bluetooth RSSI, Bluetooth direction finding, Wi-Fi RSSI or fine time measurements, uh, ultra wideband uh, or none of the above or you haven't decided yet. Uh, so please feel free to answer this question. Uh, and I will uh, soon close uh, this uh, this uh, uh, poll, and we have uh, another question coming up. So I'm now closing it, and I actually will share uh, the feedback with you, so you also see um, what uh, you within the audience uh, have gone for. So you haven't decided yet, or you haven't decided on one of the above. Uh, otherwise, Bluetooth seems to be kind of uh, on the top uh, in your. Um, um, mind. Uh, so now coming to the next question, uh, we would like to know uh, what are your main criteria when selecting a technology and please select the top two uh, in the uh, below. Uh, so is it a low power consumption, position accuracy, total cost of ownership, large ecosystem or standardized technology or ease of deployment? Uh, so again, please select the top two uh, of those uh, criteria that are important for you when uh, choosing a technology. And while you were, you're doing so, I just want to remind you that you can still ask a question in the tab question, and we will address them at the end. So I will now close uh, this poll. Thank you very much for voting, and uh, I will share this with you. Uh, and it seems that uh, the top two are uh, low power consumption and uh, position accuracy. Thank you very much for this. And now I will uh, end back to uh, the presentation and uh, hand over the world now to Matthias. We'll uh, dive into Bluetooth direction finding. Matthias, the, word, the floor is yours. Thank you, Agnes. So let's dive into the details of Bluetooth direction finding. As you have seen in one of the slides, uh, or in, uh, yeah, in the two slides, there are mainly two methods, angle of arrival and angle of departure, which are very similar. The main difference that we are sending in the opposite direction if we compare both, let's say, methods. And uh, therefore, I decided to explain the principle of uh, this Bluetooth direction final on the example of angle of arrival. So let's explain the principle of angle of arrival uh, let's explain here in the, com in the following slides uh, what is defined in the Bluetooth spec and what is needed beyond the specification of the Bluetooth spec to implement such an angle of arrival system. 
And uh, at this slide, you can see uh, such a system, angle of arrival, where we have at the left-hand side the angle of arrival transmitter, or transmits a continuous wave to the, let's say, environment. And at the right-hand side, you can see a um, uh, Bluetooth uh, receiver, and here the speciality is that we have uh, uh, multiple antennas at the Bluetooth receiver side, which are required to measure a phase difference between these uh, different antennas. You see here, this we send this continuous wave at the frequency of 2.4 gigahertz. That's the Bluetooth frequency at the, in the ISM band. And uh, we have the main differences. You might know uh, antenna arrays already from uh, from other systems like Wi-Fi or other radar systems or whatever. So uh, the main difference between Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth here is that we have not parallel receiving streams or receiving paths on the antennas, uh, which we use, for example, at Wi-Fi for MIMO systems, where we receive multiple spatial streams on the, on uh, over the air or are able to do a beam forming or whatever. So that is not required in Bluetooth for the AOA measurement. We have a switched antenna array. So we only receive at a certain time uh, a signal over a certain antenna. That is important. This means that it is not needed to change the, trans uh, the receiver architecture uh, too much uh, uh, if we introduce uh, angle of arrival. Uh, functionality to that. The receiver then is able to sample phase information of uh, based on this continuous wave, uh, uh, what is transmitted by the uh, transmitter. So, if we take a look to the uh, to the antenna arrays, how such antenna arrays can look like. That is explained at the next slide. So usually you can imagine it is enough for a very simple system to use only two antennas. So to detect the phase shift between two antennas. But uh, in the real world, usually more antennas are used because more antennas are required to have a certain achieve a certain accuracy of uh, of this angle of arrival detection or measurements so you can see here some let's say common or main architectures on the left hand side uh, a uniform linear array antenna and then on the right hand side some let's say uh, 2d or uh, 2d antenna arrays beginning with the l shape antenna uh, with some vertical and horizontal row or a matrix design four by four antennas or it is also possible to uh, design a circular a uniform or uniform circular array uh, what you can see at the right hand side the main difference between the uh, different architectures is that you can with only one line of antennas you can measure uh, only 2D angles. That means on the horizontal, let's say, on a horizontal or vertical plane. And uh, at the right hand side, with the two-dimensional antenna arrays, you can measure 3D uh, angles. That means not only the azimuth angle, but also the elevation angle. That is important if you design such a system. At the lower line, you can see. Uh, or lower row, you can see some examples, uh, prototypes which have been developed at U blocks. At the left hand side, the L shaped antenna with the speciality that we have not only five pets or five, uh, yeah, uh, pets uh, which represent the antennas or which are the antennas. Uh, these antennas are fed by two different lines, so we can work, um, or both, all antennas can work. As, uh, with a horizontal or vertical polarization. So in fact, we have here five antenna pads, but 10 antennas working. On the right-hand side, you can see a four by four antenna array with only one polarization, also prototyped at Dublox. 
So what is the basic AUA principle? This is what it would I like to would I would like to explain at the next slide. So you can see here a very simple example at the right hand side the, this drawing. Um, the, the incoming or the, you see two antennas, antenna one and antenna two and uh, incoming wave front. That are the red dotted lines which arrives first at the antenna one and then uh, later uh, with a certain phase shift at antenna 2. And this is what we would like to detect. This uh, black dotted line, uh, the vertical, what is vertical to the wavefront uh, represents the, let's say, the shift of the signal uh, depending on the angle of the incoming signal or the arriving signal. The angle theta, what we are interested in is then calculated by the arc cosine uh, and uh, this um, multiplication of the phase shift of phi and the wavelength and uh, divided by 2 pi and the distance of the antenna. The main an important assumption here is that we expect a planar wavefront. You can imagine usually the wavefront is not planar. If we transmit from the single antenna a wave, uh, it is transmitted in the, uh, with a circular wavefront as you would throw a stone into the water and then you observe the propagation of the wave, then you would see a, a circle. And this is also here the case. And uh, we can expect a planar wavefront only at a certain distance and this is what we have to consider here. Uh, if we have a certain distance, the distance is big enough then we can uh, neglect uh, the influence of the circular wavefront and assume a planar wavefront. This is the case after let's say 10 times lambda. It depends also a little bit on the ar antenna architecture of the receiver or the size of the antenna but we can uh, say 10 times lambda or more, uh, uh, we have then uh, we can expect the planar wavefront. This, if we take the lambda of the 2.4 gigahertz uh, of uh, 12.3 centimeters, then we can say after in the distance of uh, 223 centimeters or more, we can expect the, expect the planar wavefront. The second um, assumption is, or requirement is, that the spacing of the antenna does, doesn't um, should not uh, extend or, or um, should not bigger than uh, the half of the wavelengths. So with that, we can avoid uh, uh, aliasing phenomenon. You can expect, uh, you can imagine. We, the, the wave is uh, propagated with the, or the wave is propagated with a certain period and so we can expect if we have a wider distance between the antenna uh, um, an aliasing phenomenon. So how the transmitter uh, works according to the Bluetooth spec this is explained at the next slide. So the transmitter, uh, as I mentioned already, transmits a continuous wave. This continuous wave uh, is in fact a consecutive, uh, a consecutive uh, uh, sending of uh, once. If we take this uh, modulator, let's say the frequency shift keying modulator, uh, then we add to the carrier frequency 250 kilohertz and this is still then a continuous wave and how th this is the way how it is done here uh, not to ex uh, not to um, to switch off the the modulator here just using the same uh, architecture uh, the constant tone and this is how we call the continuous wave constant tone extension cte is appended to a regular Bluetooth packet. You can see the packet structure here um, below. It starts with the preamble, then with the address, then the payload of the packet, 
And then we have a cyclic redundancy check. And after this cyclic redundancy check, we append the continuous uh, once and what uh, is here uh, drawn as a continuous wave signal below. So how the receiver works, that is explained in the next slide. Um, you see here again this receiver architecture, the right side the drawing. Uh, the receiver um, receives the modulated part of the packet and then it starts with the CTE analysis or sampling of the CTE. Uh, you can see this below here, this uh, a timing, let's say, diagram, uh, which starts with the guard period at the receiver side. The, at the guard period, uh, the, uh, we we have the time to stabilize the signal. And you can imagine we come in, we are coming from the modulated part from the packet of the packet. And this is anyhow filtered with the Gaussian filter, and this has influence to the phase, and ne it needs some time to stabilize the phase and the frequency at, uh, fr uh, coming from this modulated part. Therefore, we have this guard interval or guard period uh, introduced. Also, this guard period can be used for switching to the right antenna. Then it is followed by the reference period. The reference period is used to compensate the time dependency of the of the transmitted uh, continuous wave uh, you can imagine the the wave or the the phase shift is not only depending on the location of the antenna or when the signal uh, arrives at a certain antenna it also develops with the time and this is what we don't want to measure the development of the phase with the time therefore we need this reference period to compensate this dependency of the time so then we have this switching slot and the sample slot you see many of these slots following here and in the, during the switching slot we can switch between certain antennas and in the sample slots we take some samples of the iq data and this is, uh, yeah, um, has a length of a mandatory length of two microseconds, switching slot and sample slot each two microseconds, and optionally it can be reduced to one microsecond. If we count all the times together and uh, assume a wave, uh, a continuous uh, or a constant tone extension of in, in total 160 microseconds, then we can support up to 75 antennas but usually it is uh, uh, done in a different way we support less antennas it means also hardware costs uh, reducing hardware costs and repeat some measurements with the antenna in the round robin manner so we start with the first antenna second third and then in this example we could repeat this measurement so we have many samples or several samples per antenna then measured per CTE Okay, so a frequently asked question is how to measure, how we are able to measure the phase at 2.4 gigahertz. Isn't it that we uh, have to sample this signal then with a multiple of 2.4 gigahertz? And uh, to answer this question, I introduced the following slide. To explain the receiver uh, architecture, um, the common architecture is IQ down conversion architecture. You can see here at the left hand side the drawing. Uh, it's the incoming signal, the RF signal coming from the air. Then it is uh, mixed with the local oscillator frequency, what is similar to this RF frequency and the direct down conversion. It consists of the, or it provides the carrier frequency. And then the IQ down conversion uh, does the uh, mixing with two signals. Uh, it's uh, I signal and the 90 degree shifted Q signal. So we have two numbers at the end at the output. Uh, we see at the right hand side, the baseband signal uh, consisting of two values, what you can treat as a complex value or named IQ data. And this IQ data uh, consists of or has information about the phase of the signal and the, and the magnitude of the signal. But it has much lower frequency. 
uh, here in our case, if we have a direct down conversion architecture, we have 250 kilo, kilohertz. How we can measure it, the 250 kilohertz, uh, the measure the phase at this frequency. And this is explained at the right hand side with some, let's say, equations. The mathematical representation of this down conversion is described here. Usually, this down conversion is, or not usually, in all the cases, the down conversion is done by a multiplication of two sine waves or here two cosine waves or cosine signals. We can see the frequency RF and the frequency of the local oscillator, and we can see the phi. That is the, the, the phase what we are interested in, in the first line. And if we apply then the addition theorem, some of you might remember this, uh, then we can restructure uh, the equations and then we can see uh, below this gray box um, uh, a new equation what consists of the cosine and in the, in the brackets the frequency of the radio frequency and the local oscillator and the phi. And if we say this, uh, the baseband frequency is then the difference between the radio frequency and the oscillator frequency, we can uh, then uh, set it into the last equation and then we have exactly described the signal what we uh, receive at the output of the receiver. And we can see here the phi is still visible. So the phi, what we want to measure at the radio frequency is still visible in the baseband frequency. And this is the reason why we can use baseband frequency, uh, uh, measure the phi uh, angle in the digital domain of the receiver and doesn't have to have a multiple of 2.4 gigahertz for phase measurements. So how we can estimate the angle of arrival from the phase? This is explained in the next slide. Um, we have uh, several IQ samples then at the receiver output. And uh, this is uh, up to here, it is specified in the Bluetooth specification, but we need uh, to apply some algorithms to receive uh, angle of arrival in the end. We could apply a simple cosine uh, or arc cosine equation, what we have explained in one slide before, but this would uh, uh, cause uh, or would, would result in some, uh, let's say, inaccurate values. Because the signal is compromised, we have noise and the main imp impact here is the multipath propagation of the signal. We have many reflections, so we need a super resolution algorithm that is, uh, described here. We take this IQ samples, put it into the matrix, apply a super resolution algorithms, algorithm, take the antenna um, uh, characteristics in form of a steering vector, and then we calculate the pseudo spectrum. And this pseudo spectrum has at the X axis all the angles with a certain resolution as we defined here a resolution of let's say five degrees or one degree can be possible. And then we see certain maxima in this pseudo spectrum. And uh, the global maxima should represent uh, the angle of arrival here. You see it at the cross uh, or the dot, black dot with the, with the at the dotted black line. So one example I would like to give you here of a super resolution algorithm at the next slide. Very common is the music algorithm. It's the multiple signal classification algorithm. And at the right hand side, you see, let's say the, the flow of calculating it. We have a matrix of several IQ samples, several rows of the, um, or the one row or uh, the matrix of this uh, antenna. Many samples of these are collected in, the, in this matrix. Then we calculate the autocorrelation matrix or the covariance matrix out of it. Um, then we have to calculate eigenvalues or the eigenvalue decomposition and choose eigenvectors based on the eigenvalues uh, and have a noise, choose a noise or a subspace of this matrix 
and then we feed uh, at the right hand side the music spectrum or music algorithm to calculate the music spectrum. At the input, uh, you see at the right, left hand side this equation for the music uh, algorithm. At the right hand side, it, uh, the needed antenna characteristics uh, represented by the steering vector here. So at the end, we have the spectrum, what you have seen at the former slide. And then we can apply a peak search to find the global maximum. And this represents the theta, the angle, what we want to uh, estimate. You see here, we have to have many matrix operations. And this has impact to the CPU. If we want to embed it, embed such an algorithm that's really challenging and therefore some optimizations uh, have been done few other algorithms are uh, also uh, available here we have for example pdda esprit or sss we used pdda in our uh, prototype to reduce uh, cpu uh, processing power what is needed so the final slide shows uh, the uh, whole flow chart of uh, the, how we can achieve uh, from IQ samples the, the angle. We start with the configuration. As we said, we have to configure the antenna array. We have to feed the, the steering vector of the antenna. We have to configure the CTE at, this, at the tech side, at the sender side, and the sampling algorithm at the at the uh, receiver side then we do a pre-processing we can choose several uh, parts of the cte depending on their signal strengths for example then we can distinguish between horizontal and vertical uh, part of the signal and uh, choose the best one of both uh, components of the signal and we can filter out some outliers of the, C, of the IQ data already. And then we apply, as described before, the AOA algorithm, the super resolution algorithm, where we can choose or use some different uh, um, inputs from different frequencies, also from different antennas, horizontal or vertical antennas. And uh, these spectra, usually we have not only one spectrum, uh, we have several spectra can be post-processed, then combining these spectra or maxima of these spectra uh, to smoothing uh, the, uh, the, the, the angle estimation in the end. And this angle then can be used for further processing in positioning system. As Pella mentioned already at the triangle with using the triangulation, you could calculate the positioning out of it. So that's uh, regarding the de uh, details of uh, the um, uh, AOA uh, ar uh, architecture. Now we come to the demonstration. Um, we have tried several um, uh, proof of concepts. The first is um, the angle detection, so direction finding use case where we just measure with one anchor um, uh, the angle of one tech or several techs. You can see here the, the, the setup of the proof of concept. Uh, at the left hand side, we have one moving tech. What transmits the CTE signals uh, with the advertising packets of the BLE um, module. At the right hand side, we have this uh, receiver architecture where we have used the, our L shape antenna with uh, uh, dual polarized antenna elements, but only, as you can see, one row uh, of three, un, uh, three patch antennas with a size of 15 by four centimeters. Then we have this certain switch and the receiver module, uh, our module Nina before. This module then um, sends uh, the angle information to a controller, what controls the servo uh, with the mounted camera and uh, this camera then or the server should follow our tech. And this is what we can show in this short video. Next.
so you can see the tech uh, moving here with a colleague of ours and following followed by the servo or the camera the antenna here is directly behind this servo motor receives the signals of the tech and controls the servo and as you can see also at the distance at the higher distances and with some obstacles in between that is still working uh, you see might uh, observe some delays this is due to the smoothing we uh, we have to process several spectra several uh, angles and also the mechanics control the mechanics uh, introduces some delays so that's the first demo of the direction finding use case and the second proof of concept uh, with the second proof of concept we want to show the positioning accuracy we have mounted four anchors four uh, receivers uh, with the same antenna type and uh, in the square of uh, six by 12 meters or rectangle of six by uh, 12 meters you can see on the right hand side this again this l-shaped antennas what is used at the anchor and the same take is used with what we use for also for the direction finding application and uh, these four anchors then provide the angles to a positioning engine what is implemented at the laptop and this laptop then estimates uh, with the least square algorithm estimator algorithm uh, a position of the tech in the room so and this is what we would like to show in the video you can see here at the right at the left hand side the map of the office space where we did the measurement with some obstacles at the left hand side this cross that represents the shelf and also a pillar is there this white uh, circle below yeah at the bottom and you can see uh, our colleague is moving around this shelf and uh, with a certain accuracy uh, the position is estimated at the corners you can see the anchors uh, the bluetooth anchors and uh, the blue dot represents the tech and then we can also display the estimated angle of every anchor you can see with a certain accuracy uh, they do the estimation of the angles yeah that's the demo video at the next slide we can explain a little bit the accuracy the measured accuracy we have choose chosen some uh, measurement points distributed over the space here we have now a rectangle of eight by six meters and every measurement point at the left hand side has a label where we uh, have uh, written the the mean absolute error and the maximum error what we have measured and you can see the maximum error what we have measured for uh, one dot is the reference point uh, four at the lower side uh, the maximum error is here 1.8 1 1.18 1 meters and the mean error is around usually around uh, half a meter is less than uh, one meter but uh, around half a meter what we can say at the right hand side you can see a statistics of the measured uh, angles with a 50 50 percentage percent probability we achieve accuracy of uh, 0.6 meters or less and with the 95 percent probability we achieve uh, accuracy of one meter or less so or a, a mean absolute error of one meter or less yep that is the last slide of my presentation thank you Thank you very much, Matthias. I just wanted to say that uh, those videos you've seen, we also have them on our technology page. 
so maybe if you want to uh, uh, have a look and then you won't get this, uh, this delay as we saw uh, today. Um, and now we would like to continue getting your viewpoint. Uh, and now we would like to ask you, uh, which application do you foresee for indoor positioning? So is it asset tracking, uh, people tracking, <coughs> sorry, uh, indoor navigation, access control, or is it uh, another uh, that uh, would be uh, yeah, of interest, you think? So giving you a bit more time, also want to remind you that uh, we have this uh, Q&A session at the end, so feel free to uh, ask your question already now. So well, we will uh, definitely address them later. Uh, so I will now close the call, uh, close this um, poll for now, and I will share uh, the outcome with you all. <clears throat> uh, so it seems that uh, uh, asset tracking is uh, uh, number one. Um, thank you very much for voting. And then next question, we have three questions in this session. So let me go to the notes. Uh, next one, uh, we would like to know. <clears throat> Uh, what is uh, which service uh, you are considering? Uh, is it a third uh, party service locally? Is it a third party service in the cloud? Uh, is it your own service offering? Uh, is it any type of other uh, service? Or you will not need a service uh, for indoor positioning. So giving you a few more time to vote. Uh, so it seems there is a clear answer here so i will now close uh, the vote and share again the outcome with you all uh, so it seems that uh, you have your own uh, service offering for this okay and then um, the final question we would like to ask you in this poll uh, it's when you're looking at uh, security solutions for indoor positioning and tracking use cases which item is the most critical to handle? Is it integrity, privacy, spoofing, or uh, you don't need security solution for those use cases? So giving you more time. There were other questions we wanted to ask you, but uh, we couldn't because of the format of this uh, poll. So at the end of the webinar, you will be prompt with a survey and we kindly ask you uh, to answer there. Uh, so we'll get, we'll get a bit more of your input giving you a few more seconds to vote. I will now close the poll and share the outcome with you. So it seems like integrity and privacy are at the top two. Oh, sorry, I don't see this. Uh, yeah, it seems I have. Oh. Mm -hmm. I think it seems I have a small issue with my audio. I hope you heard, uh, but basically uh, privacy and integrity were the top two answer for security concern. Uh, and I was just saying also that there will be a survey at the end uh, of the webinar, so we'll be grateful if you could answer. So now the poll is over and I will hand over to Pele for the applications. Thank you, Agnes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So in this section, uh, we will give you a couple of examples of applications. We have already asked you a few questions about that. But we'll give you some example of use cases that we see could be nicely enabled by the direction finding feature of Bluetooth 5.1. So next slide, yeah. This is an application uh, we call Find My Item, uh, which has already been used uh, with a single strength based method in RSSI that I presented earlier in the presentation. Uh, it's using a battery operated tag on items that we want to locate. Could be my key, my, my briefcase, my laptop, etc. Uh, and a smartphone app to receive the beacon signal from the tag. Uh, if and when smartphones will support the Bluetooth direction finding feature, of course that will also enable an improved accuracy that can be provided for this use case. Next slide. Uh, this is a, a quite similar application and use case is a point of interest use case, which can also benefit from direction finding with AOA, angle of arrival 
uh, once that is being added to the smartphone. Uh, think of a, a venue, a museum with a lot, lot of exhibits that are has associated beacons and information that can provide more details about what you're looking at. In the current situation with the single strength based uh, point of interest information application on the smartphone can inform a user of all the exhibits in the room and allow them to select one or one to receive additional information. With a direction finding support, the user will be able to simply point their smartphone at the specific exhibit to get more information about that specific item. Next slide. Uh, in this entrance control use cases, uh, uh, it uses the angle of arrival method uh, by the entrance control system to detect how a person or a vehicle or whatever is moving around in the facility, how it's moving around uh, the door. Uh, the anchor node at the door uh, detects the angle to the person or the vehicle in real time. Uh, and uh, the person and the vehicle is equipped with a tag sending the direction finding signal. The changes in the angle is used by the system to detect if the person is moving towards the door or just passing the, by the door in front of the door. If the person is moving towards the door and is allowed to enter that, that room, uh, the door will automatically open. Quite interesting use case. Next slide. Uh, but I think as you also uh, answered the, the polls, uh, tracking of asset is probably the, the biggest uh, interest of use cases here. Many applications could benefit from, from this use case. Examples are uh, tracking of equipment in a hospital, very expensive equipment that you might need very urgently, and where is it located right now? In what room is it located? Uh, in a manufacturing site, tracking of pallets and also tools uh, to, to, to know where things are and, and get them as, as you need them. Uh, of course, as the picture shows here, tracking of goods in a warehouse, knowing exactly where things are and where the automatic forklifts are located and driving around. And as well, tracking of goods and customers in the retail facility. In this use case, Multiple anchors are deployed in the area to track. So you have to uh, do a survey of the, of the facility where you have objects and, and obstacles and, and put your anchors in, in, a, in a smart way. Uh, the asset will then be equipped with tags. And on top of that, you have a positioning engine calculating, uh, doing the calculation of each of the tags and assets to know everything about where things are located. As the picture at the bottom also shows, the method can also be used, uh, for example, in construction sites to keep track of workers, to warn them and, and warn the system when they are entering a hazardous area, for example. And the final one is uh, indoor navigation, where in this scenario, fixed located anchor nodes are deployed in the facility where you want to navigate, could be a, in a, in a a train station could be a, a department store or, or whatever. <clears throat> and it, the anchor node sends the AOD signals, the smartphone supporting uh, direction finding, and the navigation app will then connect to those anchors, anchor nodes, and is able to guide a user to find a way in the facility. Next slide. Uh, finally, an overview of the products and, and the uh, modules that we have used, uh, you know, to evaluate, to do our evaluation of the Bluetooth direction finding features. First, uh, we have the NINA B4 uh, EVK. NINA B4 is a module supporting Bluetooth 5.1, uh, quite uh, perform and, uh, good performing uh, MCU and flash and RAM, so we can we can run the algorithms for the angle of arrival and, and the filtering and, and all that stuff that Matthias was uh, presenting. This is the EVK that uh, where the module is located it has a UFL connector uh, to connect to the antenna array with the switches and the, and the multiple antennas. 
Next slide, and here are the three modules that we currently have in our, in our portfolio that supports the Bluetooth 5.1 direction finding capabilities. Uh, to the left, you have Nina B4, which we have already covered. Uh, then in the middle, we have Nora B1, which is a soon to be available uh, Bluetooth 5.2 module with a dual core, able to do uh, even more extensive uh, angle of arrival uh, calculations. Uh, and finally, on the right side, the BMD 360, which is an entry-level module with Bluetooth 5 feature support, which is uh, fits very nice into a use case of tags. And now back to you, Agnes. Thank you very much, Pele. I'll be very quick, so we have time to take some questions as well. Um, but just to remind the few key learnings we'd like you to take on with you at the end of this webinar, it's that Bluetooth 5.1 open, uh, opens up for many new use cases. We also have demonstrated that we have the technology that can deliver submitter accuracy, uh, that Bluetooth direction find benefits are low consumption, low cost, and a huge ecosystem, and that finally uBlox uh, is your natural partner for indoor positioning. Uh, to remind you that you can reach out to us uh, via online uh, form that we also have a sales network or offices next to you. Uh, I mentioned earlier we have a new Bluetooth indoor positioning technology page where you get all details uh, that we have or some details that we have explained today and you can also review the video the demo of the video that we have and if you want to see more webinars we have our ublocks.com slash webinar section. Um, and I want to open the floor for the Q&A. Uh, we can activate our webcam again, so you can see all our experts uh, giving you answers. So we had a lot of questions actually, which is really nice. If ever we don't have time to cover them now, uh, we'll come back to you offline. Uh, so I'll, uh, uh, we have a question here from um, Mr. Zygniew uh, Sagan. What would be the maximum number of objects that can be tracked uh, uh, on by one receiver? And that question is for you, Matthias. Uh, you're, on, you're still on mute. Let me unmute before. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, that uh, is the answer is very often it depends. And then also in this case, we have to say it depends on many things. Uh, of course, if we, uh, we take our system, for example, our prototype, we can calculate the spectrum uh, within, let's say, 10 milliseconds. And if you need a certain update rate, you uh, can support then, depending on this update rate, a number of texts. There is a linear, let's say, relation between number of texts and the update rate. So that is, uh, you find have to find a compromise between uh, these two, let's say, numbers or these two parameters. And we can say yeah, we can support multiple number of texts, uh, let's say 10, 20 texts, but then we have to uh, multiply uh, the update rate or the update period also with this number of texts. So if we, for example, are able to estimate the angle within 100 milliseconds uh, in total or in our case 90 milliseconds uh, for supporting one tech so you can uh, have update the angle 10 times per second but if we want to support two techs then we can update the angle per tech five times per second that the simple relation between this update rate. So the maximum number of tech is not specified. We have tried with several, but uh, I think uh, you can support many numbers, uh, many techs at the, at the same time. And, uh, but uh, uh, it, uh, this influences the update rate. Thank you, Matthias. Now we have a question for Pele uh, from Michael Meitzner. Uh, what's the reason uh, that the AOA and AUD only have a typical working range of 20 to 30 meter? 
Yeah, that was a, in the, one of my initial presentation there, the, the, the range of, of the, uh, of the uh, tag, from the tag to the anchor. Uh, that is, of course, depending on, on uh, uh, the envi um, an indoor environment, what uh, do you have obstacles and so on, and also the, the transmit power of the tags. And in, in the normal uh, low power battery operated tags, uh, this is probably what you will, will what you achieve. But that was just an example. You can get longer range if you have uh, have more power on the on the tags, transmit power. Good. We have a couple of questions from Sandy, but uh, given the time, we'll take only one. What's the, the distance between two anchors in Bluetooth five Bluetooth uh, five point one to achieve sub meter accuracy? I think this is for you, Matthias. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's also here we say it depends. We have shown it uh, um, that we have uh, submit, can achieve submit accuracy with four anchors and uh, uh, three antenna elements per anchor um, with a distance of anchors of, let's say, 10 meters. And then with 10 meters distance, we you can achieve submeter accuracy. But if you increase the number of antenna pits per antenna, and uh, yeah, this uh, this is the main influence or main parameter, then you can also increase the uh, the distance. So we haven't tried it with uh, with the three and elements antenna up to let's say 20 meters but i could also imagine that uh, 10 to 20 meters is uh, feasible uh, uh, to achieve submeter accuracy so as usual we have many parameters which influence the accuracy uh, and um, the number of antenna pads per uh, or antenna elements per per anchor is also one of these parameters I think we'll take one last question and then we have to close because we are running a little bit over time, unfortunately. Uh, so this last question is for you, Pelé. Uh, does U-Blocks have a complete system for positioning, meaning computer with Bluetooth uh, and uh, software and antenna as one package? Yeah, as we have demonstrated here, uh, this, this is currently a proof of concept uh, where we are using our, our modules and EVKs and implementing algorithms for, for uh, angle of arrival detection and calculation, and also a positioning engine on a, on a laptop. Uh, we are right now in the, in, the, in the status of engaging with some, some key and lead customers uh, uh, to get more understanding and, and uh, what what a final solution might look like. Uh, what we can provide today is the EVK and, and uh, the modules. We are working on a, a kit that will, will include tags and anchors and algorithms and, and uh, from there we will learn more engaging with customers so we'll, we'll see at the end what is our final solution. But to, currently, we have the modules and EVKs available, and, and we will have uh, hits with the with the angle uh, or the angle calculation uh, algorithms also preloaded into that. But that will come a uh, little bit later. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, there is, a, as I said, a lot of questions, so we'll come back to you offline. And um, as I said earlier, this uh, webinar has been recorded uh, and will be sent to you. Um, uh, will be sent to you via email, uh, and for the PDF, uh, you will get. Uh, uh, you should ask us as we do uh, optimized uh, feedback. To you. So thank you for joining, and don't forget to answer the survey that will be prompted to you after we close this webinar. Thank you very much to our expert and thank you very much for your time and uh, contribution to the Q&A and hoping to see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.